Hi folks, I'm Charlie. I'm going to take you on another tour of my allotment. Uh, people seem to really enjoy the last one, so thanks very much for letting me know. And it is the 10th of May. So we're still not quite out of the frost zone, but things are heating up. And we're heading into summer now. Uh, it's been a month since the last video and so much has changed between early April and early May. It's an absolute explosion of life. Some things have done their thing in the past and in between those times. Um, so I hope that you enjoy this little tour. I'm looking forward to showing you around and I hope that it inspires you to get out into your garden or out into nature. In many ways it's an ordinary allotment in that we grow food here but it's also a place for relaxation and aesthetic pleasure but first and foremost we treat it as a wildlife garden. We built this bank up using tyres filled with soil. To the left you can see our kids tree house and then comes the most beautiful part of the whole allotment in my opinion, it's the stumpery. These ferns are fresh new ferns that have unfurled over the last three weeks. We've got hostas and rhubarb. And then, growing wild out of that compressed soil is the most magnificent foxglove, which of course is a magnet for bumblebees. Look at this gorgeous insect here, can you see it? This is one of our wildlife ponds which is home to frogs and newts and occasionally grass snakes who hunt those amphibians and all around are plants which attract insects and pollinators and give cover to those amphibians. We've got comfrey full of bees, mint, sage, flag iris, uh, meadow sweet and purple loose strife which is coming up and is going to have a beautiful spike of purple flowers. Just noticed this lovely little shield bug climbing around by the pond as well. Oh and there's a little frog behind. Can you see that? So there we go, a beautiful little frog hanging out in our pond. It was born here, it's come back and one day hopefully it will mate or lay eggs in this very pond. There we go, there's another little frog there. I'm just going to see if I can find a Newton here. They're usually quite easy to find. There we go. Down at the bottom of the pond there is a baby Newt. And then just to the right of it, moving along, you can see some little leeches which we heartily welcome into our pond because they are part of that great complex network of life. This Morello cherry, a sour cherry, has been and gone with its flowers in that ephemeral way that cherry trees do. And if you have a closer look you'll see that cherries are beginning to set. Now we could net this, uh, in which case we would use a very fine gauze net that birds can't get tangled in, but we'll, what we'll probably do is just leave it for the birds. This is our pallet bed which we're using to grow beetroot at the moment. 
it's also planted up on the edges with uh, strawberries uh, but underneath that soil where the beetroot's growing is another world of wildlife habitat which is creating heat and helping the beetroots it's made up of logs and straw and decaying matter which generates heat and encourages growth in the plants above as well as providing a home for invertebrates, amphibians and reptiles. We share this space with our kids to encourage them to enjoy nature. Next door neighbours have a trampoline that they can climb over to or they can use this little mud kitchen or there's a little sand pit at this end. This little corner is our reptile habitat. It's very simple, it's made from logs, slate and black plastic. Those warm up in the sun and all kinds of reptiles can bask on them and hide under them. This is a new feature at the allotment which is a combination of uh, a beetle bucket, a hibernaculum and a grass snake nest. It is um, a deep pit filled with rocks and logs which uh, is a good habitat for beetles to lay eggs in and then there are some little entrances going in there to encourage snakes and frogs and toads and other reptiles and things to climb in and cool down. Remember frogs spend a lot of time out of water as well hiding under cover. And there's a log pile to encourage grass snakes. We know we've got grass snakes here because we've seen them in the past and they will of course hunt in the pond. And then on top we're putting all of our decaying uh, matter that we can't put in the compost, things like brambles and uh, creeping buttercup and bindweed and things like that. And snakes like to lay their eggs in decomposing compost um, because it heats up as it decomposes and makes a really nice warm place to incubate their eggs so we're going to keep on piling green matter on top of that to encourage grass snakes in. Over here in the corner of the kids mud kitchen is a common lizard basking in the sunshine. This structure we built yesterday and it's basically a strong three-dimensional frame for growing squashes and pumpkins and courgettes up vertically in order to make a little bit more space for growing. The two apple trees have already flowered and they are beginning to set fruit and along the front of them are growing some broad beans which are flowering quite nicely too. This is one of our main crops. It's a kind of Mediterranean sorrel that you see growing wild a lot in Spain. And it is lemony and vinegary and delicious and fresh. And it grows really well all year, including through the winter. You can harvest it many, many times. And it does very well in drought conditions. Next to it we've got a lovely bay tree which was transplanted about a year ago from our other garden. And this is an echium which I'm really hoping will flower this year because it's going to be a magnificent 10 to 14 foot plant with a huge big flower spike going into the sky which will hopefully be covered in pollinators. These are onions and garlic which are doing really well. Um, the garlic was planted on midwinter and they should be ready by about midsummer, so only about a month from now. This is a grapevine that was planted about two months ago. It's called Ria and it's a pinky purple eating grape. It arrived just as a stick with some wax over the tip and now it's starting to make these beautiful lush leaves which we're hoping we'll be able to train up the shed. This is called a Delosperma. This is a wild euphorbia. It's really popular with invertebrates, 
especially things like hoverflies. There are about 300 species of hoverfly in the UK, fantastic pollinators. This one with the little yellow flowers is yellow rattle. It's a fantastic plant to have in a wildflower border because it's semi-parasitic on grass so it helps prevent the grass from dominating the meadow and allows other flowers to take hold. Calendula is usually grown as an annual meaning that it only lasts one year but in Devon it seems to survive the winter okay and flower again the next summer. This is Serinthi or honeywort, again loved by bees. This is growing wild, it's a Welsh poppy. Nice addition to the beds this year. This is an arch of dog rose which is about to come into flower. This one here is a sea holly. If you don't know a sea holly, look it up. They're really, really beautiful. They've got these incredible true blue flowers which is quite rare. Uh, that's a herb called lovage, slightly aniseedy. You've got more oregano at the back there. And then there is a, an ornamental grass um, which is called red bunny tails. It's kind of not in its full glory at the moment but it is starting to form these red bunny tails. And the whole thing is very soft and tactile, so it's a really good one for little kids. Got marjoram here, which is one of the best wildlife plants, which is also a culinary herb. And all over the place we get yarrow coming up, which is a useful medicinal herb, but it's also got really beautiful tall white flowers. Chives really nice vigorous plant and you can eat the flowers. This is a raspberry patch and one of the things you can do to get better raspberries is to get in there and look for little suckers like this and if you pull out those suckers it strengthens the mother plant and you should get more raspberries. I think of all the wildlife plants, my favourite has to be comfrey. Adored by bumblebees for months and months. Borage is another of my absolute favourite wildlife plants. It's got such a beautiful flower. It's an edible flower as well, actually. And they kind of almost glow in the twilight. These are lamb's ears, which as you can see are another lovely sensory tactile plant for kids. And they can be divided, which is exactly what I've done here and hopefully in the end we'll end up with a huge big bank of them. Yesterday we were sitting here eating our lunch and a little rat ran out and grabbed a pit of bread and ran up behind the stumpery and as we came in to try and get a closer look it went down a hole into another plot 
and it left the, uh, the pit of bread sitting there but as you can see it came back for it the pit is gone this little plant with the with the roundy leaves is Aquilegia or Granny's Bonnet it's a native plant and here next to one of the apple flowers still remaining you can see this year's apples beginning to set now you might think we're a little bit weird but here's one of the things we're most proud of we've got an ant's nest now I just want to say about ants that they are another one of these much maligned creatures that people go to great lengths to get rid of but ants don't cause any harm at all they are in fact beneficial to the health of your garden in many many ways so if ant killer is one of the things that you have in your inventory get rid of it there's nothing to be gained from trying to get rid of ants In the, along the front of the beetroot bed I've planted sweet williams which will flower later in the year I've said it before and I'll say it again leave the dandelions alone they are lovely flowers and look, can you see those little tiny beetles gorging themselves on the nectar in there they are a brilliant wildlife plant if you don't have to remove it don't remove it. Isn't that foxglove in the middle just absolutely stunning though? Completely wild, complete happy accident. We used to have huge problems with both drought and slugs on this plot when we first got it about seven years ago but by mulching the soil and by encouraging a diversity of wildlife including the things that eat slugs we are now able to grow hostas out in the open. Well I hope you enjoyed that and I would like to leave you with a little thought about why you might want to prioritise wildlife in your garden. Well firstly it's that complex diverse network of flora and fauna and fungi that makes up a healthy garden from your apex predator down to your microbe and by trying to take any of those species out of the system by eradicating them you only open up the gateway to more problems so welcome everything in including the slugs that feed your toads and frogs to the much maligned weeds that allow butterflies to lay their eggs and secondly gardening can be fraught with disappointment and failure, stunted crops, failed seedlings, but if you have a diversity of life thriving in your garden, then actually you haven't failed at all. It's a complete success. So hopefully this inspires you to get out into your garden and enjoy nature.